And we're quiet all of a sudden. Good afternoon and welcome to the next installment in our webinar series, Sam Rayburn History, a joint effort of the Sam Rayburn Museum and the Sam Rayburn House State Historic Site. In today's webinar, Rayburn Remembered, we will be exploring the impact Rayburn's death had on the nation and his community. I am Stacy Flood, Assistant Site Manager for the Sam Rayburn House State Historic Site, one of 34 sites owned and operated by the Texas Historical Commission. And Emma, you're muted. Still, okay, I apologize. I tried to unmute. There we go. I am Emma Trent, Program Coordinator for the Sam Rayburn Museum, one of four locations of the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, University of Texas at Austin. We also want to welcome our three guest panelists today. Dr. Tony Champagne, Professor of Political Science at the University of Texas, Dallas. Dr. Jim Riddlesberger, Professor of Political Science at Texas Christian University, and Emily Porter, a longtime Bonham resident. As always, we are also joined by Kim Burpo, Site Manager at the Sam Rayburn Museum. She'll be working behind the scenes, keeping us on track and monitoring any questions you might have. To ask a question, simply type it into the Q&A window, and at the end of the program, Kim will pass those along to us for a Q&A session. Let's get started. Rayburn first started showing signs of illness in July 1961 when he complained of nagging lower back pain. His health and physical condition continued to decline throughout the summer, and in September, Rayburn returned to his home in Bonham for complete rest under the care of his local physician, Dr. Joe Risser. During the exam on September 28th, Dr. Risser discovered a mass in Rayburn's abdomen. Following the discovery, Rayburn was transferred to Baylor University Hospital in Dallas, where he was eventually diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Although the diagnosis was that the cancer was incurable, Rayburn spent a month receiving chemotherapy before asking to return home to Bonham. On October 31st, an ambulance transferred Rayburn to the Risser Clinic in Bonham, where he'd stayed 16 days before passing away in his sleep at 6.20 a.m. on November 16, 1961. At the time of his death, Rayburn was the longest continuously serving member of the House of Representatives and was the longest serving Speaker of the House, a record he still holds 16 years later. While Rayburn served as Speaker for a little more than 17 years, he was leader of the House Democrats for over 20 years. 
Dr. Champagne, can you tell us about Rayburn's leadership style in the house? Well, I think his leadership style was uh, quite a contrast to the leadership style of Lyndon Johnson, for example. I interviewed a number of years ago with the help of H.G. Delaney, I interviewed Senator Henry Jackson, uh, who was a major figure in the Democratic Party and of course had been in the House of Representatives. And he compared Johnson with Rayburn and, and he commented that Johnson would get in your face, he would scream at you, he would curse at you, uh, he would do everything possible to, uh, to, to try to get your vote. Rayburn, on the other hand, would just quietly try to persuade you. Uh, and if I could, let me, let, let me try to give you uh, an example or two of how uh, Sam Rayburn would try to persuade. In, uh, in his early years as speaker, one of the major votes was uh, a vote on the extension of the draft. And uh, Rayburn would just go up to people and say, I need your vote. I wish you'd stand by me because it means a lot to me. And several members of the House of Representatives said that because of that kind of personal appeal that Sam Rayburn made, they voted for the extension of the draft, which of course proved to be very, very important because shortly after that, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and we had World War II. Jim Wright told a fascinating story about uh, how Rayburn would, uh, uh, would influence other members of Congress. This was much, much later in Rayburn's career uh, when there was a vote on the 1957 Civil Rights Act. And Rayburn approached Jim Wright and said this, Jim, I think you want to vote for this bill. I know you're receiving a whole manner of secretive letters threatening you with all kinds of retribution but I think you're a big enough man to overcome that. And in the future years, you'll be proud you did. And Jim Wright said he did vote for the 1957 Civil Rights Act, but that was, that was Rayburn's uh, persuasive style. Another thing I should mention about, uh, about Rayburn is he was very loyal to people. Uh, he, one of his closest friends, I realize he was called Mr. Democrat, but one of his closest friends was the Republican leader of the House of Representatives, Joe Martin. And when Joe Martin lost his leadership of the Republican Party, uh, Sam Rayburn, recognizing his friendship with Joe Martin, called Congressman Omar Burleson of Texas, who was chairman of the House Administration Committee at the time. And he told Burleson, once a speaker, always a speaker. I want you to provide a limousine for Joe Martin. And so Joe Martin got a speaker's limousine, uh, even though he, of course, was no longer leader of the Republicans and, had, uh, and was no longer speaker. Joe Martin had earlier served as Speaker of the House of Representatives, in fact, had been Speaker for four years. The other thing about Rayburn is he was, he was very open in, in talking to you and explaining why he wouldn't do what you wanted him to do. Omar Burleson, for example, told me that when Rayburn was Speaker, he wanted to be chair, he wanted to be on the Ways and Means Committee. He, the Taxation Committee of the House of Representatives. Uh, and Rayburn just told him, no, you won't be on the Ways and Means Committee as long as I'm Speaker because you're too conservative. After Rayburn had died, of course, Omar Burleson was put on the Ways and Means Committee. But as long as Rayburn was Speaker, he was not on Ways and Means because Rayburn felt he was too conservative. One other story about uh, Rayburn's uh, uh, leadership ability. Congressman Frank Thompson of New Jersey told me this story. Uh, 
he had given a speech where he was very critical of Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson. And Rayburn called him into his office and said, Frank, I don't think you should be criticizing the Democratic leader of the Senate. And Thompson said, but I disagree with him. That's why I was criticizing him. And Rayburn said, I don't think you should be criticizing the, the Democratic leader of the Senate. And by the way, Frank, I know you're on the board of trustees of the District of Columbia Stadium, which later became the Robert F. Kennedy Stadium. Mm -hmm. I need to give that appointment to someone else. And so Thompson said when he left Sam Rayburn's office, there was a resignation letter for him to sign resigning from the Board of Trustees of the District of Columbia Stadium. And he said that was, that was just discipline. That was Rayburn saying, you shouldn't be criticizing Lyndon Johnson, and I'm punishing you a little bit for that criticism of Lyndon Johnson. So I think that kind of is a, is a good illustration of Rayburn's leadership style. Now, Dr. Riddlesberger, Rayburn's successor was John McCormick, and John McCormick had served alongside Rayburn as sort of his right-hand man for almost 14 years. So did he carry on in the Rayburn style? Well, actually, they, they had been colleagues since 1940, so it had been, uh, uh, he had been uh, the uh, whip of the Democratic Party even when Rayburn was minority leader. So uh, they were a team uh, from the very beginning. And of course, um, they had a, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Tony said that Rayburn was known for his loyalty, but so was John McCormick. Uh, John McCormick worshiped the ground that Sam Rayburn walked on, um, and, and Rayburn reciprocated. Uh, Rayburn was incredibly loyal to John McCormick um, and, uh, uh, and wouldn't cotton any criticism of, of McCormick, uh, uh, and uh, partly because McCormick was the first Northerner to endorse Sam Rayburn when Rayburn ran for majority leader, which of course was his stepping stone to becoming uh, Speaker of the House. Um, very, very different personalities. Um, uh, Rayburn was, as Tony has shown, a master at kind of personal relationships. Uh, he knew how to talk to people. He knew to how, to how to appeal to their better their better angels. And if not to their better angels, uh, he knew how to, to hold, uh, uh, hold the stick over their head uh, to make them do what they probably didn't want to do. Um, but he had excellent skills in terms of working with people. And because of, as Tony has pointed out, because of his disarming uh, honesty, uh, was universally respected uh, on, on both sides of the aisle. McCormick was kind of his heavy. Uh, McCormick was a very partisan debater. He liked the, uh, the policy side of, of uh, the House. Um, and he was not a good interpersonal leader at all. Uh, just one example, and I know we're going to talk about the Board of Education later, but I think it's an important example. Uh, Rayburn, of course, uh, went and threw back some bourbon and branches with the, with the boys. And in those days, we're talking about uh, a very masculine uh, uh, organization of the House. Um, and, and smoked uh, cigarettes and cigars with, with them, and they swapped stories and told lies and, 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 and thought about what was going to go on the next day uh, in Congress. McCormick, of course, was, had taken a pledge as, as a young man to be a teetotaler, didn't, didn't ever imbibe, uh, and had uh, dinner with his wife on time, 6 o'clock p.m., every day of the week um, for their 51 years of marriage. Never. Uh, ate dinner without Harriet, um, and, and usually room service in their home in Washington, which was the Hotel Washington. So at the end of day, McCormick would come in and shake hands with four or five people, and then he would say, excuse me, but I have a standing date with my wife. Um, and, and, and he was not the kind of person that made close friendships. Um, people respected him. Uh, they knew what he could do. Um, he was a great organizer, but he didn't have that personal touch that Rayburn had, nor did he have the universal respect. And much of his time as speaker was spent kind of trying to swat off challenges, and particularly challenges 
from younger members of the House of Representatives, most famously Morris Udall of, of, of Arizona, uh, who thought that McCormick was woefully out of touch with modern America. And in many ways he was. I mean, uh, uh, Tip O'Neill once said, and of course Tip O'Neill was McCormick's uh, protege and, and his strongest supporter. Tip O'Neill said that John McCormick wasn't uh, 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 just conservative. He said he was so conservative he didn't even burn the candle at one end. Um, his idea of a, uh, you know, of a of a uh, kind of uh, risque night out was going with Harriet to Baskin Robbins to uh, uh, to uh, get a scoop of ice cream after dinner. Um, so he was increasingly, I think, uh, out of touch that the house that he was leading. Now, I have to say the most productive years in U.S. legislative history uh, took place with John McCormick as Speaker of the House. Uh, so any perception that he was an inept leader, I think, is an absolutely inaccurate one. Those first years of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, 63, 64, 65, um, enormous legislative accomplishments. And while Lyndon Johnson uh, rightfully gets a lot of credit for that, uh, certainly, McCormick walked hand in hand with him through that entire time and did so quite ably. Now, Rayburn was a staunch supporter of President Kennedy, as witnessed by his efforts to enlarge the House Rules Committee. Dr. Riddlesberger, was McCormick equally as supportive as, of the president? Yes and no. <laughs> um, McCormick and Kennedy had a very complex relationship. They were mostly on the same side in terms of uh, in terms of policy. Uh, they were both liberal Democrats. Uh, they were both uh, they were from from you know neighboring districts in uh, in in uh, Boston. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know Kennedy and McCormick served together uh, the six years that Kennedy was in the House of Representatives, um, and and so they got along fine in terms of policy. Uh, and they understood they were they they had a kind of a mutual non-aggression pact with one another. Uh, they never kind of spoke ill of one another the whole time that they were um, uh, in, in Congress together and then when President Kennedy was, uh, was president. That said, uh, they were very, very different. Um, Kennedy, of course, was legendarily um, a, a, a woman's man. He was a man about town. Um, it, it had His reputation as a playboy was was uh, was unexcelled in Washington. Uh, McCormick was the button down conservative, uh, um, uh, loyal to his wife uh, person. Uh, so so loyal to his wife that he lied about his age on their marriage certificate. He was seven years older than he was, but he didn't want to embarrass her uh, to ha having you know to marry a younger man. So he lied about his age. Uh, um, one of a number of things that he did. Um, that kind of misrepresented who he was. Um, John Kennedy was the gregarious, uh, pale fellow, well met, uh, loved working the room, um, uh, loved you know, uh, back slapping and and uh, and 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 heavy drinking uh, when when necessary. Uh, and 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 McCormick, of course, was anything but that. Um, our friend Garrison Nelson, uh, the author of of, of uh, McCormick's biography, talks about the fact that. Uh, uh, McCormick kind of had to hide behind being Irish when in fact he was Scotch Irish, not Irish. Uh, and his brother Nako uh, was a well known Southie in Boston. He was a bar owner uh, in Boston and was kind of McCormick's cover for being Irish because McCormick was so un Irish in his presentation of self. And of course, McCormick was an extraordinarily serious legislator and thought that uh, Kennedy was a lightweight. So the two of them were very different in the way they approached politics and what made things even worse. And this is the most famous episode. And you can imagine how difficult this is. The president of the United States in 1962 had a younger brother, Edward Kennedy, uh, who ran for his vacated seat in the United States Senate. Uh, they had held that seat open uh, until Teddy uh, became 30 and was eligible to run for that seat. Uh, that was uh, the masterwork of, of their father, Joe. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, John McCormick, who never had any children of his own, uh, his brother, Nako, uh, had a son, Edward. So we had the, the, the contest of the two Edwards 
running for the Senate against each other in 1962 when McCormick is Speaker of the House after Rayburn's death uh, and, um, and, and Kennedy is President of the United States. So at the very least, that was an extraordinarily awkward period uh, because while you know John Kennedy obviously was very close to his brother, um, Edward McCormick was the son that John McCormick never had. Um, and in fact, when when uh, Harriet died and McCormick moved back to Boston after he uh, after he retired from Congress, he lived with Edward for the last ten years of his life. So um, that's how close he was to his nephew. So you can imagine the clash that that uh, really set off uh, in in Washington in 1962. Both Kennedy and McCormick went to great effort not to let that competition. Uh, interrupt their professional relationship, at least on the surface in, in Washington. But my gosh, what drama there was behind the scenes. Sounds like it. Now, Dr. Champagne, there are a few things that are synonymous with Rayburn. And Dr. Riddleber Dr. Riddlesberger has always brought one up, and that is the Board of Education. So can you tell us, it, the Board of Education didn't start with Rayburn, but can you tell us just a little bit about the Board of Education and the way that Rayburn used it. Sure, I'd be glad to. The, uh, the Board of Education started really, in, in one sense, long before Sam Rayburn. Uh, the Board of Education room is H128 in the Capitol. And it originally was the committee room for the Committee on Territories not exactly the most important committee in the House of Representatives, to say the least. But in 1901, Speaker Joseph Cannon took the room and said, I want this to be part of the Speaker's offices. And uh, Speaker Cannon used the room mainly as kind of a hideaway office where he could go to get away from people when he didn't want to be in the official speaker's office. Uh, that was continued by other speakers. Uh, speaker, speaker Rainey, for example, Speaker Henry Rainey, used the room mainly to handle paperwork so he could get away from being bothered by people. Uh, but the, uh, the idea of the Board of Education really probably began with uh, the, the Board of Ed Education as kind of a, a communications network in the House and a social network in the House probably began with Speaker Nicholas Longworth and his great pal and speaker to be John Nance Garner. And they used uh, uh, the Board of Education H128 when Longworth was speaker and when when Garner was speaker, but they actually had a similar room even before those days. They used it primarily to meet with members of Congress, talk to members of Congress, try to persuade them to vote a certain way, uh, and to drink a great deal. Both, uh, both Nicholas Longworth and John Nance Garner were very, very heavy drinkers. Uh, and John Nance Garner said that after every congressional session when Longworth was speaker, they would go to the Board of Education room and drink for about one and a half hours or so uh, and basically discuss the legislative agenda for the next day and hash over what happened in the legislature uh, during that particular day. Rayburn was a, was a regular at those Board of Education meetings back in the days of Nicholas Longworth and back in the days of John Nance Garner. And when, when he became majority leader, he, uh, he basically took over the Board of Education room and began using the Board of Education as a way to, to uh, talk with members of Congress over drinks, uh, discuss the legislative agenda, reach political compromises, tell tall tales, and have a few drinks. 
Uh, it was very, very common that uh, Wright Patman, uh, a congressman from the first congressional district uh, up around Texarkana, would be a regular at the Board of Education meetings. Uh, Homer Thornberry, who was on the Rules Committee and a congressman from Austin, would be a regular. Uh, Richard Bowling, a congressman from Kansas City and a member of the Rules Committee, would be a regular. Frank Eichard, who was a, 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 a Texas congressman from the Wichita Falls area, would be, would be a regular at the meeting. Lou Deschler, the parliamentarian, longtime parliamentarian of the House of Representatives, would be a regular. And then there would be some irregulars who would, who would come in uh, when it was necessary to discuss the legislative agenda, when it was necessary to reach political compromises, uh, that sort of thing. But it was a way to sort of have informal discussions uh, and, and, and learn about what was going on in the House and learn about what compromises needed to be made in terms of, of the legislature. Uh, oddly enough, it was not uncommon for Sam Rayburn to invite reporters to Board of Education meetings. The understanding was the reporters could come, they could, they could participate, it's just they couldn't talk about what was said at the Board of Education meetings. But it was very, very common for reporters to attend. One could not imagine reporters in, in the modern world being invited to these uh, confidential drinking sessions where, uh, where legislative strategy was, was being discussed. Uh, but uh, from the time Rayburn was majority leader to the end of his speakership, uh, the Board of Education was, was really an important part of the way he functioned as a leader in the House of Representatives. You have to remember, you have to forget about today's House and remember that back in those days, chairman of committees were very, very important. Members, any member of the Rules Committee was very, very important. Any member of the Ways and Means Committee was very, very important. So it was possible to make deals and arrangements on the legislative agenda with a relatively small number of members of Congress. And I should add, there are a couple of other things I should add. Jim Wright, who uh, Tony and I uh, spend a lot of time with, uh, said, you know, that an invitation to the Board of Education, which Rayburn hated that name, by the way, he just called it the yeah, little room downstairs. Uh, but an invitation to the Board of Education was a command appearance for a young member of Congress, obviously. Uh, and so it was heavily sought after. And uh, Rayburn could really buy votes uh, on critical issues just by inviting people uh, to come down and have a drink with him in, that, in those circumstances. And of course, exactly. the most... It was, it was kind yeah. of a reward uh, right. for members of Congress. And it was also a way to test out members of Congress. If someone was identified as kind of a bright, young, up and coming member of Congress, they would be invited to the Board of Education so that Rayburn could sort of sit down with them over a couple of drinks and get a feel for, for that person. Is this person truly an up and coming member of Congress? Can I work with this person? And actually, that's the way Richard Bowling. Who, who became a very, very important member of the House of Representat Representatives, that's the way Richard Bowling initially aligned himself with Sam Rayburn. And, right? and it, was, totally. it was kind of an accident too, Tony, because Bowling was from Harry Truman's district in Missouri. I mean, Rayburn didn't know who he was. Uh, it, it, he probably would have never even gotten his first invitation except for Harry Truman. Um, yes, so, you exactly. Know. Harry, Harry Truman told... Uh, told Rayburn, this is an up and coming person, you should, you should meet him. Wright Patman also told Rayburn, this is an up and coming person. And so he's invited to the Board of Education and Rayburn basically decides, hey, I can work with this person. And ultimately, of course, Bowling goes on the Rules Committee and ultimately becomes chairman of, of the Rules Committee and becomes a major ally 
of, of Sam Rayburn in terms of the younger, more liberal members of the House of Representatives. So it was also a kind of recruitment device for Rayburn to, to recruit people uh, to his faction within the Democratic Party in the House. And the most famous thing that ever happened in the Board of Education, of course, is that's where Harry Truman was when he got word that uh, Franklin Roosevelt had died. Uh, he was throwing down a bourbon and branch with, uh, with Speaker Rayburn, his very close friend. Reflecting on Bonham and the 4th Congressional District, Mrs. Porter, can you tell us what it was like growing up with Sam Rayburn as your congressman? I can tell you that we were all so proud of him. Uh, and he he was he was proud to be from Bonham. He would uh, spend a lot of time there, all the time he could, really. Uh, and he was really good about mixing with the people when he was there. Uh, he was well known by everybody. And in fact, at that point in time, most everybody in Fannin County and in the fourth congressional district were Democrats. It wasn't until about 2004 that we began to have Republicans in in our county anyway. Um, teachers taught about uh, Sam Rayburn, which is, I'm not sure true anymore. I'm sorry to say they don't know that much about them themselves, so they don't really teach about him like they did. Uh, families listen to him on the radio. That's the way we <laughs> communicated back in those days. We were, like, the whole family would be sitting around the, the radio and, and listening to what was going on. Uh, of course, he was in newspapers. Um, and uh, he uh, many times appeared at the Fannin County Fair made speeches uh, about what was going on in Washington and what was important to the people back in uh, our county and in, in his district. Um, he also uh, was uh, in, involved in a lot of the parades that we had downtown. You know, sometimes he would be in the car in the Cadillac uh, and sometimes he was being riding in something that somebody else gave him but one time after the rodeo parade uh he came back to simpson park and which is where the parade was breaking up and uh got on my dad's horse and had his picture made with the uh, sam rayburn jr mounted quadrille i've got a copy of that picture a copy uh another copy of it is in i don't know if you can see it uh, is that close enough you can even see? Uh -huh. uh, we can kind of see it, yes. Uh, Mr. Raymond sitting on my dad's horse, Prince, and uh, he was really proud of the fact that uh, the quadrille was named after him because it was uh, boys and girls that were from uh, 12 years old. You had to be 12 on up through high school. And uh, they rode in pairs and did square dancing on horses. It was a, and it would, they practiced constantly. Believe you me, I know I had to go to the practices and sit there and watch. Uh, they, uh, they were really quite good and he was quite proud of them. And that picture still stays in his room at the Sam Rayburn house. Um, one of the, the other things that he did um, that made everybody know who he was was Jones Field at, uh, at the time of the uh, World War II, they knew that they had to make more uh, airfields. And so one of the airfields, Mr. Rayburn um, had all the influence in the world built here in, in Bonham, which was a real asset to us. We already had a small landing strip, kind of a crop duster field. And uh, that was turned into a pilot training field that, uh, brought us a lot of instructors that lived here and and brought a lot of young really interesting people uh to the bonham area during that time um lake texoma of course was a big deal for our area and his district and uh when the the news was was constant that uh that mr rayburn had gotten this for our 
our district. And it was so important because of the conservation that it would be doing for Red River because when the, the spring rains came and the early fall rains, we always flooded. Our, our fields for our crops were flooded by the river. And the, the building of that uh, huge lake and the big dam and the, being able to control the water coming out of there and down it was such a great thing for all those farmers that lived up and down the river. Uh, so, you know, he, he did a lot of things for us and, and people knew who he was um, really all the time. Um, when I was a child and I, I, was, I was really pretty young, um, my aunt worked for a law firm in Bonham that did a lot of work for Mr. Rayburn. And so when he was in town, many times he would have paperwork done by my aunt and as a little girl, she let me tag along. Sometimes I'd sit out in the car if he, if she was just running in to get papers signed. But if she was going in to have papers that he needed to read through and look and, and discuss, then usually she'd take me inside with her. We'd go up to the back door of the house, go in on through the porch and over to the kitchen. And he'd come in usually from the study in there and they'd spread out the papers on the kitchen table. Uh, and uh, two or three times, Bobby Phillips had baked a cake or some cookies and they would share those. Uh, and that was, you know, that was when I really thought <laughs> this is pretty good because I'm getting to go, uh, getting to go and get something to eat. And what I remember most about it was the dishes on the wall in, the, in a cabinet in the kitchen that uh, had pictures of a house on it. And I kept thinking, I've never seen dishes that had a, a picture of a house on it. Uh, and later I found out that that's a very famous house that's on those dishes. Uh, but anyway, that was one of my very favorite things to get to do was to, to ride out there. And I can't imagine now how you could have access to anyone that was as important as Mr. Rayburn and just drive up in the driveway, park your car and, you know, have a, a, a cookie with Mr. Rayburn. Um, my father also knew Mr. Rayburn and knew him well. Uh, they fished together a lot, uh, shot together some, uh, and usually every year uh, in one time of the year, sometime he would have, Mr. Rayburn would have a fish fry out at the uh, Ivanhoe farm. And uh, of course, dad would go whenever he could. And, uh, and of course they ate fish and played poker and, and uh, had a good time in general. So he really was friendly with the, the people and the population. Um, and as TV finally came along, when we could uh, actually see things, uh, and, and TVs in those days were, you know, something rare. If one person on a block or in an area had one, then all the neighbors would be called in to come see what was on the television. And the kids would stand outside and look in the window so that they could see what was going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we saw Mr. Rayburn on TV and we, could, we got to see him at the Democratic Convention being up there with his gavel and uh, in being in control of everything. And, you know, the conventions then were just so great. They were, I thought they were really exciting, even as a kid because uh you know they would say you know the great state of texas wishes to put in nomination or wishes to cast so many votes for so and so and then there'd be all this band playing and people running around with signs and banners and until mr raven would gavel it to a close you know and uh, then the next state would get up but they were interesting conventions and we we all enjoyed getting to of course, TV was such a big deal. It was a, such a novelty at that point in time. Um, 
Mr. Rayburn also uh, decided at one point in time that he wanted to raise polled Herefords, and he felt like that was a good thing for the ranchers to get started and learn, you know, about that breed. And uh, so he worked really hard with the county agent here to uh, get them started doing that. And uh, they, that was a good thing for the farmers and ranchers. And he was always thinking about them and thinking of better ways for them to be able to, to do things. And lots of times he thought that the best way to get them to do it was for him to do it first and, and show them that it, you know, how, how well it could work. Um, when he was gone, people, yes, were very sad in Texas. Uh, they, they knew that they had lost the uh, inside that they had to getting things done. And of course, whenever you lose a congressman who has seniority, you lose things anyway. You, you have a hard time getting things accomplished. But to lose the Speaker of the House, and then of course, uh, as Lyndon Johnson became the vice president with Kennedy, we also lost uh, his leadership in the Senate. So um, we were really, Texas was without leadership and in places where we knew we needed it and, and people were well aware of that. Uh, and they, they were concerned that, uh, that the big additions that Mr. Rayburn had brought to Fannin County would disappear. Uh, Buster Cole, who was the uh, president, uh, he was this, actually the secretary treasurer of the foundation, the Rayburn Foundation, uh, told me one time, we've got to get busy and make sure that we keep the VA hospital here. And I said, well, how are we going to do that? And he said, well, I have a plan. I think that I'll get the people that I know that have influence in Congress and we'll get a bill passed through Congress, renaming it the Sam Rayburn Memorial VA Center. And when we do that, perhaps it will keep them from ever moving it from Bonham. Well, I don't know if it had ever, <laughs> if it really had any influence over it or not, but it is still here. And at that time it had about 150 employees and now it has over 800. So uh, it was a good plan and, uh, and it worked out well. Uh, we, uh, we were also concerned about losing the National Guard Armory, which was here, uh, that Mr. Rayburn had definitely brought here. Uh, and it, uh, it did finally, the, guard was moved, but it was many, many, many years later and we do still have the building and it, it's just been redone and, and renamed. So uh, many of the things that he did for us uh, did continue. And it was really, everyone loved him and loved his, his style of dealing with people. And, and it really was basically that he really made a friend of people and tried to, uh, to work with people by making a friendship with them. I'll have to admit, when I was that little kid going up there and having cookies or cake in the kitchen, he had scared me to death. <laughs> he was very serious about those papers, <laughs> you know, and he very seldom ever smiled or laughed. It was serious business when we went there. So I thought he was mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, when I leave, I think, oh my goodness, I don't know if I want to do that again or not. <laughs> but but uh, as I look back on it, it was really, really fun times. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing all that because as a person who grew up in Bonham, you have a unique perspective and definitely having an aunt that worked for him gave you an interesting opportunity as well. I do. I want to thank you all for answering our questions, but now we have some time for questions from our uh, attendees to the webinar. So remember, if you have a question for any of our panelists, then simply type it into the Q&A window and we'll try to answer them as they come in. You know, one thing I saw the, the question here about, uh, please talk about LBJ. Uh, Emily, a, a fun story. I once showed a picture of, uh, 
uh, Lyndon Johnson kissing Sam Rayburn on the top of his bald head. Uh, it's a quite a famous picture. And uh, I showed it to Jim Wright, and he said LBJ was the only man alive who could have gotten away with that. <laughs> he says, uh, because he says Mr. Rayburn, you know, he was very serious, and he didn't cotton to that kind of uh, uh, silliness. Uh, but but of course, he had such respect for Lyndon Johnson uh, that uh, that Johnson got away with it. So uh, yeah, so your your uh, kind of fear of him was something that uh, was not uncommon. And of course, Rayburn, though he was well loved, could be a salty dog. Um, and uh, Tony can recount well, uh, um, you know, when when Republicans began to come into the Texas congressional delegation, um, that uh, that Rayburn could could be very salty, and particularly was salty about Bruce Alger. Um, yeah. And when Alger was in Congress, uh, Jim Wright was a young member of Congress, and. And Fort Worth got a modern federal building before Dallas did because Rayburn said, as long as Bruce Alger is your congressman, uh, Dallas is not going to get uh, a federal building. And uh, when Earl Cabell, then the mayor of Dallas, uh, ran against uh, Alger and defeated him for election, uh, they immediately built a, a federal building in Dallas and named it after Earl Cabell. Oh, oh, I see. I think the problem with Bruce Alger got started because Bruce Alger uh, told the press, compared uh, Sam Rayburn to Santa Ana. And that, that just did it as far as uh, Sam Rayburn's relationship with Bruce Alger. Uh, initially, the Texas delegation would meet on a regular basis. And after uh, Bruce Alger made that comparison with Santa Ana, it was no longer the Texas delegation that met, it was the Texas Democratic delegation. Bruce Alger was excluded from the meetings of the delegation after that. And with some very salty language uh, <laughs> that Rayburn said to his face. <laughs> well, we do have a... It, it is true that Sam Rayburn did have a temper. Uh, I remember H.G. Delaney talking about how when Sam Rayburn would really get upset, his, his face would, would turn red, and that redness would go all to the top of his bald head. And finally, the top of his head would turn purple. And you do then, you better get out of the room as quickly as you could. Well, we do have a question. The The person who asked about LBJ has, has specified they'd like for someone to address the LBJ and Lady Bird's personal relationship with Rayburn. Oh, if I could start, and, 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 and I know Jim can, can, can finish. Uh, I think that uh, I think I think Sam Rayburn thought that Lady Bird Johnson, in particular, was one of the most wonderful people that he possibly knew. Uh, really, of the of the uh, of the spouses of of members of Congress, uh, Rayburn was very very close with Lady Bird Johnson and very close with Lindy Boggs. Uh, Lindy Boggs was the was the wife of Hale Boggs, who was the congressman from New Orleans, and and they were they were very very close. And when Hale Boggs died, Lindy Boggs was elected to to uh, take Hale's position. But of the of the uh, spouses of the members of Congress, there are very few women who were members of Congress in those days. Of the Spouses of members of Congress, Lady Bird Johnson and Lindy Boggs, were without a doubt the the ones that that Rayburn just thought were were wonderful people. Uh, he visited their homes frequently. He would eat dinner with them. He would play with their children, uh, and uh, I think the relationship between him and those two women was just was just absolutely wonderful. It was like they were his daughters. Uh, in terms of his relationship with Lyndon Johnson, I think actually the relationship had highs and lows. Uh, the biggest low was probably uh, around 1940 
when Sam Rayburn supported John Nance Garner for the presidency and Lyndon Johnson supported Franklin Roosevelt. And I think that was truly a low point in, in their relationship. Uh, I think Sam Rayburn thought that, that Johnson should support a fellow Texan uh, and particularly someone who Rayburn was so close to. I mean, uh, Rayburn had been a protege of John Nance Garner. And I think that was kind of a bad spot in the Lyndon Johnson, Sam Rayburn relationship. As certainly by the time Lyndon Johnson was elected to the Senate, Sam Rayburn was beginning to recognize Lyndon Johnson probably had a better chance than any other Southerner for being president of the United States. And I think that he really tried uh, to promote Lyndon Johnson to be president of the United States. Uh, so I think he saw Johnson as someone who, who was very able and someone who just had tremendous potential. But the relationship was not always great. In 1940, it was very much on the negative side. And, 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 and Johnson, um, as Rayburn got older, Johnson began to think of Rayburn in similar terms to some of the younger people in the house, uh, that Rayburn was of an older generation and didn't quite understand modern America. And he became a little bit less attentive uh, to Rayburn's recommendations. Uh, and Rayburn used to express extraordinarily fr extra extraordinary frustration that Johnson, who he said was just as independent as a pig on ice, uh, that was the that was the reference he continued making about it. So they were very close, uh, but their relationship was his. I, I think that that one of the things, as Tony has mentioned, the thing that that probably smoothed over their relationships uh, is, is that he just adored Lady Bird, and and Lady Bird, uh, I think, um, a number of times uh, would uh, would cure their uh, petty fighting, which could could be kind kind of intense uh, with with a Sunday meal. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, Lady Bird was sort of the great diplomat in the relationship between Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, they were a lot like father and son, and they they really did have they in in you know they they had uh, high low, highs and lows, and they often knocked heads. And then of course they worked together very well at other times. Okay, and well, just, uh, just imagine <laughs> having a speaker and a Senate Majority Leader. From the same state, I mean that that is just a a remarkable advantage for the state of Texas, and I'm sure and, they both recognize that as well. Yeah, and Emily, to to pick up on what you said about the water projects, uh, among other things, you know, the old joke was that it was a good thing that Johnson became vice president and and Mr. Rayburn died because if that hadn't happened, Texas would have been underwater within ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again. Thank you all again for sharing your opinions. Uh, our our webinar today really was to explore, you know, the the impact of Rayburn's death and and sort of the void it might have left behind because 2021 does mark the 60th anniversary of his passing. So, sort of as a conclusion to our questions here, I want to ask our three panelists in your opinion. What was the greatest impact that Rayburn's death had on either Congress, the nation, or the fourth congressional district, or even Italy, even on Bonham? Just I'm going to let kind of Tony run anchor here, but I, I'm just going to say something up front. When Rayburn was speaker, he took care of Texas number one. He uh, state was much more important then than it is now, uh, and Rayburn always considered himself a Texan almost first. And as speaker, as, as majority leader and then speaker, he made sure that there was a Texan uh, on every major committee in the House. Uh, and he made sure that they were the quality Texans that were on those positions. Um, Jim Wright, when he came to Congress, wanted to go on the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, because he was interested in foreign policy. And, uh, and, and, and Rayburn said, uh, Jim, you don't want to go on that committee. That committee you know, foreign policy is made in the Senate. You're, you're not going to have any influence there. I want, I need you on the public works committee. 
And of course, that was the most important thing in Jim Wright's career because he used that as the launching ground for his own uh, moving into the leadership. And so Rayburn made sure that Texans were represented. And while when he died, we lost a huge amount of influence, there were influential Texans on every major committee in the entire House of Representatives, and many of them lasted 20 and 30 years after Rayburn's death. Dr. Champagne? If, if I could just add a few comments. I think the, the loss of Sam Rayburn was sort of the loss of the last member of the House of Representatives who had just enormous prestige, not only among Democrats, but among Republicans as well. Uh, and I have, I have thought often about, uh, about how he was able to gain that pre prestige. And as, as Emma has, has mentioned, of course, he was the longest serving speaker of the House of Representatives. In fact, still is the longest serving speaker of the House of Representatives. At the time of his death, he was the longest serving congressman. He had been the chairman of a major committee. He was the workhorse of the New Deal. Uh, he had been very, very effective as a speaker. And he was, he was in politics in an era when Democrats and Republicans actually talked to one another. Yeah. It was possible to compromise with one another. Mm -hmm. These are words like compromise uh, are, are just unknown in, in the modern House of Representatives. But I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a conference that I went to many years ago at the Library of Congress. I think Jim may have been in that, in, in that conference where, where Gerald Ford spoke and Gerald Ford was talking about the House of Representatives and Gerald Ford said, well, when, when I was in Congress, he said, I learned at the feet of Sam Rayburn. I learned that politics was basically getting opposing sides together and making an agreement. And that was Sam Rayburn's approach to politics. It was recognizing this is a huge country with many different views, and you need to try to bring those different views together to make good policy. And then after Gerald Ford spoke, Newt Gingrich spoke. And Newt Gingrich said, politics is war. Yeah, it is. And the idea is, you win a war. One side or another wins a war. And I thought to myself, that's really the difference between Rayburn's influence and Rayburn's era and today. In Rayburn's day, politics was not war. Rayburn didn't see politics as war. Politics was a way of bringing opposing sides together. And today, of course, it's, it's all different. Politics is war. You either win or you lose, but you never compromise. His, his famous Rayburnism, of course, was about the, the legislative process, was that any jackass can kick a barn down, but it takes a carpenter to build it. Which and we exactly. are in the carpentry business, he, he would exactly. say. Over, that was one of his most common. I've always said, uh, just as a footnote, you know, when, when we have conversations about the greatest legislators in American history, I argue that the debate has to start with number two because position number one has already been taken. Uh, Sam Rayburn is almost without question uh, the most influential legislator in the history of the United States. Mrs. Porter, do you want to add a quick word? Uh, just a quick word that I, I agree. I think that everyone now talks about we need another Sam Riper so that we could begin to have some working relationships going in Congress and get things accomplished and just not just, you know, have investigation after investigation and nothing else being done. You did ask me about the foundation and uh, and we never, never get to uh, 
do that. But really, you asked me at one point in time, or you were going to ask me about what they were doing after Mr. Rayburn died, what in the world was their or deal and what they were looking for and what they were doing. And I can tell you that they were looking to figure out how they're going to manage the properties. And um, that was a big deal for them because there were many and Mr. Rayburn had been doing all of that. And all of a sudden they were responsible for having to raise the money to keep all of those things functioning. And they didn't really know how they were going to go about it. So they spent a bunch of time trying to figure that out quickly because then you had to be done quickly. Fortunately, it looks like we're about out of time. I want to let everybody know this webinar has been recorded and will be posted soon on the Sam Rayburn House website. Visit samrayburnhouse.com. We will also include answers to questions we may have missed. If you think of a question later or have a suggestion for a future topic, feel free to email us. We're working on our 2022 webinar schedule, so be sure to check both the House and Museum's websites and Facebook pages for those dates in the coming year. We want to thank our panelists for their insights into Rayburn's legacy and to thank you for joining us once again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good thank evening. You. Jim.